believe is going to be the event that the entire world is waiting for. And we are here to remind ourselves of this coming event and also ensure that we are properly prepared for it so that we don't just keep coming to church and ultimately we find ourselves closed out when the event takes place. And uh, the Holy Spirit led this church and the guest speaker, who is myself, who was invited to choose on a theme, this particular theme. But uh, the theme really is not my choice. I think it's work of the Holy Spirit in me. Because I was thinking about Maranatha. And I said, what's the meaning of Maranatha? What's the meaning of Maranatha? Maranatha is Jesus is coming again. So we developed a theme around the name of the church so that we can live a more meaningful uh, way as a church family. We exhibit the true meaning of our name. So now we'll go through our slogan. Maranatha. That's a bit weak. That's a bit weak. We are so dotted everywhere. But you can still uh, do it better than that. Maranatha. Jesus is coming again. Total member involvement. Win one, lose none. Win one, lose none. How long? Annually. So we we'll add that word so that it doesn't become endless. That you have to win only one soul until Jesus comes. So we put a come and a caption as a limit. So we do it again. Total member involvement. Win one, lose none. Annually. Can you add that? Yeah. Win one, lose none. Annually. In other words, what is the assignment? That's the message in summary. The Lord is calling us to leave our name. To remember that Jesus is coming again. That's the event we are waiting for. And we are waiting for that event with a lot of eagerness. Why? Because we know when Jesus comes, according to Revelation 21, all human suffering will come to an end. All that you are going through will come to an end. When he comes, he will create a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, what we are noticing now that has really hurt us for long will be over. The end of sin will come, the end of death will come, the end of sickness, the end of family challenges, social problems, political problems will come to an end. We will have a new world. That's why this is the blessed hope for anybody who has known Jesus Christ. I did inform and remind each one of us that uh, there is nothing better that this world offers other than this promise of Jesus Christ our Lord. You need to improve on the sound system. It's echoing quite a bit. Fundu Amitambo, work on something on this one. Yeah, it is. Inside there, trying to manage it. Thank you very much. So don't be so low, I don't want to strain my voice too. It should be soft and nice. All right, so that's why we're here to emphasize it. The Republicans have something to offer you. They want to offer you the America of your dreams. Um, the Democrats also want to offer you a presidency that you can count on. In a bid to convince you that they are the people of the moment. They are the ones to give you the future. But I'm here to tell you that I belong to another party. The party of destiny. Hallelujah. Yes, yes the party called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are the ones who have the truth. We know what's going to happen. We are very, very sure it's going to happen. And we know it is the one that is going to solve the problems of the Americans. It is the one that is going to give them the future that they really long for. And therefore, that is the message we are considering. I want to say again, welcome into God's presence. And you catch up with us from where we are. From where we are. Now, today's, by the way, on the 13th of, uh, of this month, the next Sabbath, after this Sabbath, we are going to conclude this series. And we'll have a very significant event. We'll have a baptism. A major, major baptism. And... Um, the pastor had prayed with the team of leaders here 
that at least God gives them 30 people to be baptized. To join the church at the end of the evangelistic campaign, I say that, that is the faith of this church. That's what you ask God to give you. If you had sought for my advice, I would have told you differently. And maybe I would have scared you. So I'm working with your faith, and I pray that the Lord will do much more than that so that he can challenge you to increase your faith. If we did our assignment well of leading one soul to Jesus Christ, each member, I'll guarantee you we will have had about 120 people getting baptized. At the very minimum. Something very much doable. The only problem we have here is many of the members are just spectators when it comes to evangelism. We can do every work that we are doing. We don't have time to tell people Jesus is coming. We don't have a burden for them. We have a burden to work with them. We have no burden to live with them in heaven when Christ comes. If we have that burden, we will struggle with them, pray for them, wrestle with God for them. And as we are talking now, they'll be here listening to this message. The messages that I have in an evangelistic campaign are not for nurture of members. These messages are intended for non-adventists. God has given us a special message to prepare the world for his coming, which is not preached in another church. And I'm presenting a series of this message in beats every evening. And I'm praying that at the end of it all, it will bless you and revitalize your knowledge of truth and revive you spiritually. Though you are already in the faith and probably have had some of these before. I'm also praying that it will introduce you to what you are going to use this series next year when I invite you back home in East Africa. We are having a very major campaign. We hope by God's grace we will baptize one million members new believers into the faith come June next year. And the Spirit of God led me to support you as a young church. The best way I can help you, since you didn't go out while I'm here, most of you, is to take you away from here. America may kill you with these shifts and schedules. I want to not, 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 not to allow you to be choked by the programs that you have here. I want to take you home so that I, 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 I go and, and, and give you a chance to preach for two weeks. To evangelize. And as you work on the souls of other people, and you see them coming to Jesus, it will revive your soul. And uh, when you come back, you will be a new man, another church. Hallelujah to God. Amen. That's the direction the Spirit has led me. So I'll make sure I'll still struggle with you. I'm not coming here just for two weeks. I'm here to stay. Yeah, but I may not be here physically. I'll stay here spiritually. Hallelujah. Yeah. Until what God assigned us to do has been accomplished. And maybe God is going to use you as a small church to bless the entire North American division. Because when they hear of what has happened in your church, and when they hear that miracles are happening here, they'll come to inquire, what is the secret behind it? And they'll come to know that the secret is total member involved. And everybody has to go out. We don't want idlers in the church of God. In the Seventh-day Adventist church, in the time that is remaining between now and Christ comes, we can't afford to have idlers. You don't have to come here and idle every Sabbath. Every meeting, you are always feeding, being fed, being fed. You are not sharing out. You are not being a blessing to the community, to your neighborhood. That's not God's will for you. That's not God's will for you and for me. It is that you receive a blessing and you go out. Even those that are going to be baptized. On Sabbath, there will be evangelists next year. And I'll be talking about you, you are a great evangelist coming from the United States of America. Can you imagine that? And you are one of them. Hallelujah. Amen. Tell your friend that you are one of the evangelists. <laughs> be prepared. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we need to start praying about it, praying for one another. And I mean business. The Lord really wants you to participate. We'll give you the sermons. And these sermons that I'm preaching are the sermons you're going to preach. And all that you need to do, you just need to look for a ticket 
to and fro. Give you the message. You ask is to make sure you go. And I'm giving that message immediately I leave here. And uh, I'll get the list of those. And I want you to prepare the list tomorrow. They will write the names. And even those who are here, register. Have their details, their email addresses, their telephone numbers. And I'm going to start communicating with you immediately. And I'll give you the messages instantly. So you start reviewing them in readiness for next year. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let me see a show of hands. How many feel cold and want to participate in that great evangelistic campaign? Rise up your hand to God. Pastor, by God's grace, I'll come. That is going to bless you. That's going to bless you. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Today's message is still on the title, Jesus is Coming Again. But there's a smaller title behind this. What is behind rising crime, school violence, and terrorism in the world? As I talk to you, this is my topic tonight. What is behind this? And we need to understand really what's happening in terms of prophetic messages that the Lord has revealed to us. A very simple answer, but critically true. Critically true. As I speak to you, the challenge of rising crime is very high. Extremely high. And of course, lately, America, which is known to be a safe nation to live in, is not safe anymore. Crime is in the rise. The killing and shooting um, that we have, that is uh, race-oriented, uh, the shooting of the policemen, because of revenge, and such a spirit is on the rise every other day. We talk of... Uh, uh, school violence, I don't know what happens here, but I've seen many times people come in schools and shoot and they kill students. In Kenya today, students are, I don't know what has happened, the spirit has come. Everywhere in the country, students are burning down schools. Burning down schools. And they end up blaming everyone, and particularly the Minister for Education. And they say you should resign. You have failed to stop this. Is he the one really responsible? Who is responsible for this? Terrorism activities. Terrorism activities are everywhere. Today, what was considered to be saving Europe is being attacked from within. Using methods that have never been used before. So, what is really the cause for this? What is the cause for this? Now, before we consider that, years ago, the home was a place of refuge and security. We know that. This has been the same throughout the centuries. You know, in the home, that's where you could find, enjoy good time, your daddy and mommy, while you're security. And you have a chance where you can play with daddy, you can play with the children. This is how many of us grew back at home. When you had them, even when you had difficulties and trials and troubles, home was a place where you could run to. Yeah, when you meet and you receive a hug from mom, from dad, you feel at home and you feel secure. Warm, loving embraces and hugs produce a sense of well-being. As a boy, you could work with your father at home and enjoy that fellowship and your father trains you how to work and you feel proud of it and i remember doing that with my dad that was home but in the last 20 years or so things have not been working right in the world the 21st century homes are often a battlefield words of abuse words like abuse are being used today Conflict, anger, hostility are commonplace when describing about family today. Look at that gentleman. Are you familiar with such a kind of looks at each other? 
and uh, the child is wondering what to do to lead to a truce. We have no control anymore. We do this before the children, our own children, and they don't know what to do. They, they get mesmerized. But that's the truth about today in the family. Long are the days when uh, parents will quarrel in the bedroom and come out united before the children. Now we are not able to control our emotions. We read about families who spend very little time at home. Children eating on the run. You know, that is what we call here in America. You are eating on the run. What do you come to do at home? At best, they rush home for a meal before they leave again. And uh, the home has become simply a place to eat and sleep. But there's nothing, no fellowship going on. I, we had 10 in my family, and uh, we are six brothers. I'm the eldest. And I know my father now is old. Uh, he got sick and he came to Nairobi. And then we took him to hospital. After he came out of the hospital, he told everybody, I want to go to pastor's house. That's where I want to go and stay. But you see, I've been traveling a lot. My wife was a bit unwell, but uh, she's just recovered. And so she can't drive. And he's sickly. He needs to be taken to the hospital. I live distance away. Nairobi can be terrible with jam. And so he needed to stay closer to the hospital. My youngest brother, who culturally is supposed to take care of him, lives very close to the hospital. And so we had decided as brothers, that's where dad is going to stay. And he'll do it. And he insisted he wants to come to my house. For one reason. And my brother also said, what the end of What the end of Because I don't know, how, I've never lived with my father. That's what he told me. My father is a stranger to me. Because now for me, the best he can tell me is, and if I have money I give him, we are done. We have no serious intimate relationship. But for me, when I'm with my father, we are like, you know, brothers. We have a lot of things to talk. When I married my wife, I married her. She stayed with my parents for years. They developed a relationship. And uh, my wife knows what my dad eats, how he eats. Uh, she knows how rough he can be when he's uh, not handled well. And she knows what to do, how to fix it. So that feels comfortable. And the brothers have got used to it. They got married in the city, and there they have been. Their wives are not used to that. They don't know how to cook for him properly. He keeps complaining. My brother had bought a whole goat and put it in the fridge. And then the doctors told him, he should not eat meat. Now, cook on a kila kitu. And that's what the wife knows how to cook. Siom kisi, she's a lawyer. So, Dad looked at all those scenarios and wanted, no, 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 no. I want somebody who knows how to cook for a kissy old man, how he should eat. And he knew where he could get those services. And I'm telling you, in those days we grew with our parents, we got used to them, we accepted them as they, the way they were, we embraced them. But it's not that way nowadays. Our parents are strangers. Our children are strangers to us. When they are very young, we go and leave them in the house. We are working and working and working. After a short while in Kenya, they are taken to boarding schools when they are very young, from about eight years or so. And then they only come home after they are done when they are on vacation, and for a very short time. This is the challenge. So children don't know parents, parents don't know their children. That is the scenario today in the family. And you know the number of single parents is growing in our society today. So the structure of the womb is very different. Imagine a son, a boy who has been brought up by a mother, all through, he doesn't know what a father figure is. What kind of a husband is he going to be? What kind of a father is he going to be? Many of us who have come and have been brought up in families that are already divorced, this poses a challenge today in society. We are asking ourselves, why is there a parent breakdown of morals? Why is there crime? Why is there uh, war? Why is there destruction of all types? 
Why is there terrorism? But sometimes we too have a share of blame. <laughs> Another major challenge that we face today is the internet. The internet. And uh, you know, many parents today are seriously concerned. When we have family life agents, they'll say, what do we do? The internet is everywhere. Nowadays, children don't have time to come to where the parents are. They're in the bedroom. If they're in the sitting room, they're on their phones. All the time. You call them, they don't even hear. And if they say yes, and they're still on. They're still on. And they're hooked there. And you don't know what they're watching and what is they're being exposed to. The home used to be a safe place, but today the home has been completely devastated by the internet. Now through television and internet, children have been exposed to excessive violence, sex, and a total lack of decency, and morals have invaded our homes. Look at those children. And where the eyes are hooked up, only God knows what they are watching at this time. And you don't know the children you have and what they watch when you are there and when you are not at home. So, but the major things that I've done here is excessive violence, sex, and total um, lack of decency and morals. That is what the children are exposed to from when they are very young. A complete distortion of values is occurring right at home. Things are changing dramatically because of what our children are exposed to. Look at this one here, just lying on a couch, a high-tech media society which offers sex, violence, and greed as its prime time, at its prime time viewing is in serious trouble. You know, here in America, Hollywood has invaded the homes. With whatever they produce, that's what is the formal education that everybody receives. And that influences the entire world. And therefore, our children are exposed to competing values. They are exposed to various versions of right and wrong. That's what's happening. They are competing values for the minds of our children. So the child gets confused. At one point is being told this is right, and another point is being told this is wrong. But again, when you meet, you tell them this is right and wrong. When they listen to the TV, they are shown what is right and wrong differently. When they go to school, they are taught what is right and wrong differently. Which one should we follow? Our children are confused in the process. You can look at the face and the look of that young child. Now, on average, by the time the young people are 18, they have witnessed, somebody has done this research, they have witnessed 200,000 violent acts on television and movies, including 40,000 murders. You know, they have been exposed to that by the time they turn 18. Now, you might be wondering, does the form of entertainment we watch make any difference in our thinking process? Does it really produce some of the violent behaviors that we have in the world today? Without a moral compass, I want to tell you, my fellow Christians, we are thrown into a state of confusion. We do not seem to know what to do to manage this situation. And therefore, we have let loose and we are waiting for whatever that is coming upon us. We don't know. I don't know what you are going through right now and what you are crying about. You came to America. I don't know whether you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are getting the blessings you are looking for. All the lifestyle of America has completely thrown you out of balance. So that by the time you grow, after some years, what you thought would be a blessing to your children, it will now come to be the greatest curse that ever happened in the family. Some of us, like Naomi of old, by the time our children are up, you have nobody in, that you can look up to, even to take care of you in old age. And you will wonder whether coming over to America was the right choice that you ever made. 
you don't have a wife, you don't have a husband, you don't have children, what are we going to do? Does this have any indication towards the end of the world? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Let's get now back to God's word. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26, the Bible says that he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. We want to dig out and find out where we went wrong, where we lost it all. The Lord tells us he who trusts in his own heart, in his own heart, is a fool. You see, the mind can deceive you. You can justify almost anything if you depend on your own mind. Or thought processes. In fact, Hosea also puts it this way. They sow the wind and they reap the wild wind. They sow the wind and reap the wild wind. If you sow the wind, you'll reap the wild wind. What does that mean? We have been sowing the wind of violence in the media and we are reaping the wild wind of crime. We have been sowing the wind of immorality. And we have been reaping the whirlwind of divorce, rape, and child abuse. This is a cause and effect thing. All these things that we have exposed our children to is coming back to us in the crime that we see today and the violence that there is and even the terrorism that there is today and lack of tolerance because we do not inculcate values at the right time to our children that could produce the kind of people that we long to have in society. And so what you see today is as a result of the impact of what we exposed our children to over the years. So how do you protect moral values in an immoral world? How do you protect your children? How do you protect your grandchildren? I don't know what society will be like by the time your grandchildren are up and they are moving around. I don't know what they'll be like, what this country will be like. I don't know. I don't know where we are headed. In the book of Revelation, God provides a clear-cut answer. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, as a message for the last generation of men and women living on planet Earth. And we looked at that yesterday, spent some time to look at it, and this is the message God has given us as a people of destiny, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, to share with the world, to give them hope, even when they seem to be losing out on everything, especially on the challenge of morality and the family and the society. Just to remind you of what we read yesterday, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here is a very urgent message that the Lord has revealed that needs to be preached to all the world. The last message from God to this earth that every human being must hear and either choose to accept and follow or choose to neglect. And there's no another message coming. And the next thing we expect after here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the message that God has sent me to bring to you. All the package of the message that I'm sharing with you is a part of the three angels' message, which is the last message of hope for this world. Now, what is... He saying in verse 7, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. What is He saying in this verse? This very urgent message that must come to you has this section of it. Fear God and give glory to Him. Now, what does it mean to fear God and to give glory to God? And he's saying you need to do these two things. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has died. Why is there so much crime and violence? Why is there so much immorality? 
Why is there so much lawlessness? This is what this text says. The judgment of God is taking place in heaven. As we're talking right now, what we call as the investigative judgment. The judgment that precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ. All who have claimed to be Christians, God knows our hearts. Those of us who are genuine and those of us who are not genuine, He knows. But the angels don't know who is genuine and who is not genuine. Because angels cannot read our minds. Even the devil cannot read your mind. I can't read your mind. I can't know what you do in private. But God knows. And everything that you have done, even those things we do in private, are recorded in the books of heaven. And in the judgment, the books are open. And what we have done, we are judged according to our deeds. And therefore, before Jesus comes, the Bible tells us, He's going to reward everyone that is coming according to their deeds. How does He determine who should be rewarded with eternal life and who, should, who is not worthy of eternal life and therefore eternal destruction? It is on the basis of what is recorded. God knows it. But for now, there is a peruso in the records of heaven of each one of us who has claimed to be a, a Christian and particularly the remnant church your name comes up and your life is evaluated Pastor Kinder is a Christian a seventh-day Adventist Christian a pastor, a man of God how has he lived? there is what is known about him and there is what may not be known about him and your name goes through scrutiny to determine the reward that you receive. So the judgment calls us to accountability for our actions. In other words, God's message to the world is, remember, that's a warning. That's why the message is first. Whatever you do, you will be held accountable. Hallelujah to God. My sister, my brother, we will be held accountable. Don't think that uh, we'll go scot-free. You may hide it very safely, it may never be known, but when the Lord comes, your destiny will have been determined, because the Lord knows every detail. And the angels will know this, because as they, He comes with them, they already know those who are going to receive eternal life, and those who will not receive eternal life. So there is a judgment coming, going on, going on right now, and our names are appearing in that judgment. And therefore, judgment means accountability. We live in a world where people don't want accountability. We, judgment implies responsibility and moral choices. If I'm not responsible for what I do, how can God's judgment hold me accountable for those actions? That was the question. Now, people reason, if I have no responsibility, if I'm an alcoholic, because my father was an alcoholic and my grandfather was an alcoholic, then I'm not responsible. Have you ever had such a reasoning? I am an alcoholic because I inherited genes of alcoholism. And therefore I should not be blamed. My grandfather and my, grand, my, and my father have, have led me into this. So it's not me to be blamed. Mm. There are many excuses. If I'm a drug addict because I was abused as a child, then I'm not responsible. Some argue, and that's the reason why they justify what they do. They don't want to take responsibility for their actions. Everybody's out shifting. There are wrong decisions and sins, blaming them on others, but not themselves. I'm clean, I'm not responsible. I am a criminal because my genetics made me that way. I'm not responsible. The society we live in is a society that largely says you are not responsible for your actions. So it also declares right and wrong is something every person determines in their own mind. The idea is I'm responsible only to myself. I'm not responsible to a higher power God. That is the kind of a society we live in today. But the Lord is telling us through this message 
in Revelation 14, the last message to the world, whether you try to convince yourselves that you are not responsible, you will be held accountable. You will be held accountable. Go and tell every human being. They will be held accountable. There is a judgment that will expose this. You know, judgment implies responsibility and moral choices. In the last days of earth's history, God is calling men and women to judgment. Does God have a standard of morality and a basis for his final judgment? That's the question. So God is telling you judgment is going on, my elder. Judgment is going on. My sister, judgment is going on. You are being held accountable for your actions. And when Christ comes, your destiny is sealed. My destiny is sealed. This is the truth of what's going on. Now the question is, what is the basis of the judgment that is going on in heaven right now? Now God's law is the basis of morality and the standard of judgment. Amen? Amen. What is God using? The law. The law. Which law? The Ten Commandments. Law. The law of the Ten Commandments. That is what God uses to judge you and me. That is what he uses to judge us. The law. Now the book of Revelation speaks to a society that says, My mind is my highest standard. There is no judgment. They say, I'll make my own moral choices. That is the kind of thinking that will be popular before Christ comes. But I'm telling you, God has given us a message to remind the world that there is a judgment going on and the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is still intact and is the standard that will be used to judge your actions and my actions. The Apostle Paul, I mean James, the brother of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his book, which he wrote as the Spirit led him, he says in chapter 2, verse 12, So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The entire law of God is the law of liberty. Let's see a few examples of this in the, in the law of God. In Exodus 20, 13, the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. That's what it says. Thou shalt not kill. This law liberates you and me. Because it tells you what you should do that is right and what you should not do. Now, this is a grandmother and a grandkid here. That law teaches you that life is sacred. The sanctity of life. Life is, you are not the giver of life and you have no moral authority to take away life. When you are taught that from when you are young, to respect life because you are not the giver of life. It makes you, it liberates you from ignorance. You know what you're supposed to do and what is not true. Exodus 20, 14, another command. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now this preserves the sanctity of the family. This preserves the sanctity of the family. It protects the institution of marriage. Imagine if you don't teach that rule, then what happens? You cannot keep the family together. That is what preserves the sanctity of the marriage institution. Exodus 20.15 also, another law, thou shalt not steal. This is another law of liberty. And it, uh, it, it helps you and protects you and protects your possessions and our property. Now think of the chaos in society if the principles of God's law were openly disregarded. If you come and say, there's no law, the law of God is not binding, so you don't teach and expose your children to these particular principles of morality, they grow without knowing them. Then in the future, they will steal and their conscience will not accuse them in anything. They will from the TV, from other sources that have neglected the law of God. And as a result, they have been exposed to 
what now they consider to be normal life. And that is the cause behind all the mess that we see in society today. Now in Revelation 11 verse 9, 19, the Bible says that the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. I want you to know what's going on in heaven. While the mess is on the earth and it's happening here, focus your eyes on what's going on up in heaven. What is Jesus doing? John was shown in vision what's going on in the temple where Christ is interceding for you and me. What is the ark of the covenant? What is the ark of the covenant? Now let me show you a little bit here. Now in the, in, in the sanctuary in heaven, on earth by the way, the church of the Old Testament, there were three sections in the church. There is the outer courtyard where everybody came and uh, they came to worship and you had to come to the outer courtyard. Then the second section was called the holy place. The holy place. In the holy place, uh, only the priests, the pastors, were the ones who could enter there. No common Israelite was allowed to go to the holy place. And then the most holy place, the inner room, the innermost room, this place, not even the priests were allowed to go. Only the high priest was allowed to go there and only once a year. Only once a year. And this pattern is symbolic of the pattern of the throne of God. What's going on in heaven? How heaven is organized. And now, on the earthly sanctuary, if you look at uh, and what is here, this is the inner room. This is what he called the holy place. And this is what was there. There was a table that had bread. And, uh, and then there was this, uh, the candlestick that was always burning. This bread could be changed after some time. And then there was this altar of incense where when the, the blood that you have come and confessed on the, on, on the animal, on, on the sheep, after you have committed sin, and then you are able to slaughter that animal to down your behalf, the priest brought that blood, and then he had to sprinkle some of it here, this curtain that divided here. Here is where God's presence appeared. And so, and then he could put on some incense on the burning coals that were here, and the smoke that was a good smell, which is your prayers, went up beyond the curtain into God's presence. Now, inside the most holy place, this was the throne of God. When God appeared, His dazzling presence appeared. That's why you see the brightness here, white. And these are two angels representing the throne of God in heaven. And inside here is the box. And this brazen, uh, uh, what, what now called here the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, this box here, inside it were the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. They were kept here. And so, which shows the character of God, the character of God, who God is. The character that you and me must develop in order for us to one live with God in heaven. And therefore God used to appear here before these two angels and the devil used to be one of these before when he was Lucifer. Now he's the devil of course. Gabriel took over from him. I wish we could divulge into all that. But you see the emphasis here is that the character of God represented by the Ten Commandments was at the very heart of God. And uh, right now The law of God is very much central, very much central. It was placed in the sanctuary as the basis of all morality. Now, the Ark of God's covenant contains His law, and that's what I've already told you. God's law is the foundation of His throne. It's the foundation of His throne. Some people think the law has been dealt with. You, you don't need the law. Welcome, children. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming. Welcome with your teachers. Welcome. Please sit quietly. And we want you to listen. We want you to listen.
Thank you teachers for doing a wonderful job. We have a parallel campaign going on among the children. Cut it, but it's to your own peril. Now it says judgment and law are part of the gospel that must be preached, the everlasting gospel. No, but someone says, I thought we were saved by grace. And we didn't need to keep God's law. When Christ was crucified on the cross, he was judged as a sinner to pardon all of us. You know, some of us and many of the churches today teach that the law was dealt with on the cross. And since that time, we are now free. We don't live in the era of the law. We live in the era of grace. We we'll look at that shortly. But I want to emphasize the fact that uh, judgment and the law are part of the gospel. We we'll just explain that briefly. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know, I may not think it is sin to steal something, but sin is lawlessness. Sin is more than what I think in my own mind. Now, what does the Bible define sin to be? Sin is breaking the, the law of God. The man says, look, I'm not satisfied in my marriage. So if I go out for a weekend with my secretary, that's okay because it is two consenting adults. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit you know, you may convince yourself that it's okay. It was not rape. It was out of consent of two adults. And therefore, if we agreed and went out, there's nothing serious wrong. My conscience is clean about it. But I want us to be reminded once again that there's a law that governs how you should relate. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And if you go ahead and do it, you know you have sinned because you have broken the law of God. And you'll be judged on the basis of this law that forms the foundation of God's throne. God's law is his eternal moral standard which defines sin and establishes our accountability to God. His law defines what morality is. Even if your mind does not, the Bible says sin is breaking God's law. And the book of Revelation also says um, you are responsible for your actions. You are responsible for your actions. Now let's look at this. And what our children need today is not a diet of murder, violence, and immorality on television. Our children need to be taught the moral principles God has given to us. Hallelujah to God. Amen. May I repeat that again? What did I say? Instead of exposing our children to the TV, and they are always there, every house I've visited, and I've visited quite a number of them, is a struggle to stop the children from switching on the TV. As we get to the house immediately, they have held this thing in their hands. And cartoons, another thing that they are watching. Even it's a, it's a challenge to tell them, stop, we want to pray, and persuade them. And of course, in America, you have to know the tone you must use and other things. And now you have to toe the line, otherwise they will be taken away. And so you really struggle to know what to do. And uh, we are letting loose. We are allowing them to watch anything and everything. And even we as Adventists are letting that happen as Christians. This is the reason why we will not help our children. You will have nobody to blame later in life when you see the breakdown of moral fabric in society. We need to teach our children the moral principles that God has given. We need to teach our children the law of God. We need to expose to them the reality of what's going to happen. There is judgment going on, my children. If you watch bad things, God will hold you responsible for those things. And they will spoil your mind. 
We need to expose them to that because the society today is not emphasizing on it. Because the moral law of God protects us. God's law is not some arbitrary regulation to restrict our happiness. We should need to teach our children about this. When you obey the law, that's when you experience true happiness. So that is what we are talking about here. So God's law protects us from a lifestyle which will destroy us. A lifestyle that which will destroy us. Now let's look a little bit more into this. Love always leads to obedience. Love always leads to obedience. Now some Christians have even said, we don't preach on the law in our church. Why? We preach about his love. Don't talk a lot about the law. You are legalists. Talk about love. And it appeals to our hearts. Love people. Love people. When somebody commits adultery in the church, don't be so very particular and hard on them. Love them. Show them love. Don't emphasize the mistake they have done. It has already happened. So just accommodate them and, and, and be loving and caring. That seems to be very popular. Very, very popular today in our churches. I'm a pastor. I've stayed in church boards. We try to seat. We try to discipline members. And then you bring to the church business meeting for voting. These members have been overwhelmed and has had a moral fall. And uh, the law of God requires that to help them understand the enormity of what has happened so that they can be led to Jesus Christ to repent and seek for forgiveness. We need to have them display. And some of these disciplinary actions will require that they are removed from church membership by the actions that they have done in public. And you ask members, this is evidence, it is clear, and now we move a motion to discipline this church member according to the church manual to have the name removed from membership. Who is seconding this? You will see a hand or two. And then you ask any questions, any comments, any concerns. No, no, what work is a book as You mean we have to do that? That's as an on the level, can you sign? Of course, I define a course. I like, you know, course I, you know, Pastor, these things are very hard nowadays. What our young people go through is very hard. Already she has a problem, and now you are removing her. So you try to look for a way. Is there another way? And they feel like this is too judgmental and very harsh. That is the very core issue because we have let it loose and then we are not telling our young people from the word go what is the moral fabric of society that will make them live happy lives. We are reaping our loose way of parenting. Even church members, love always leads to obedience. There's no way you love without obeying. We preach about this love. As if love and obedience and the law are two different things. If you love, love will lead you to obey. Love doesn't lead you to disobey or to disobedience. It leads you to keep God's commandments. That's what the Bible tells us. Jesus said, if you love me, in John 14, keep my commandments. Can we repeat that? If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's no way you can say love covers sin. It doesn't work like that. You may think you are trying to be caring, but you are spoiling your child. You are spoiling the church member. Reveal the truth and the Lord has given us this message for the world today. If I, I obey God, not in order to be saved, but because I am saved. So if you are saved, you are truly born again. It will be proved by your character that is in harmony with the law of God. 
So you are not obeying God so that God can accept you. You are already accepted by God. And because you love God, the heart of God. Now, by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. That's First John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Here is the evidence that we know God. Here is the evidence that we are born again believers. Here is the evidence that we are truly Christian. The evidence is that we obey His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. When we are committed to Christ, when we genuinely know Him, when our hearts are surrendered to Him, the natural response is to obey Him. Is to obey Him. So grace and law are not contradictory ideas. When you are saved by grace, you are not saved to disobey. You are saved to obey. Hallelujah to God. Now what is the role of the law of God in your Christian experience today? First of all, salvation is by grace. Old Testament believers looked forward to Christ, to a Christ who will come. In the New Testament, <coughs> excuse me, we look to a Christ who has already come. They were saved by a grace to come. We are saved by a grace that has already come. In Romans 3.20, the Bible reveals further, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what is the function of the law? By the law is the knowledge of sin. If you do away with the law, there is no sin. That is what happens automatically. Because the law reveals sin. Let's see in Romans 7, 7, where the Bible says, I will not have known sin except through the law. I will not have known sin except through the law. For I will not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, if you break God's law, it is sin. So the role of the law is to define sin. The law says, this is right and this is wrong. The law defines the moral standard of God's judgment. So then, if the law is there to reveal sin, then what is the law, the role of grace? In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Bible says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should be lost now what is grace grace therefore is God's mercy God's pardon God's forgiveness God's power God's love reaching out to sinners now once you have committed sin, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is what? Death. You commit sin, you work against the law, you commit adultery, you are supposed to be killed. You remember the lady who was caught in the very act and was dragged before Jesus? What were the men holding in their hands? Stones. They wanted to stone her to death. But and that is what was recommended in the law. But then she was brought before Jesus. And you know what Jesus did to her? He looked at the men and he saw they were not genuine. They too were sinners. But they had not been caught. And they are acting like they were holy. And holier than this woman. So he told them he was not sinned before in this manner. Let him be the first one to throw the stone at this woman. And of course he started writing their sins. Because he knows what you have done. And those are in the records in heaven. As you condemn others, you know what you have also done in the past. Don't pretend. You can only condemn somebody if you yourself have never committed that sin. And you are holy. But
But you are living today because of God's grace. He has just pardoned you. He is merciful to you. He has forgiven you. Just because you came to Jesus and said, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry. I'm the one to blame. But please forgive me. What if he says, I'm not going to forgive you? Will you blame him? No. You have no right to forgiveness. That is the right of the one to forgive you. He can choose not to forgive you and you'll be justified. But God, when he forgives you and accepts you back, that's what we call his grace. That's what we call his grace. It's God's love reaching out to sinners. In Jesus Christ, when Jesus took your sins on himself and died on your behalf, that was an act of God's grace for you and for me. Hallelujah. Yes, that is God's grace. Does God's grace therefore do away with God's law? When God forgives you, does that mean that the law of God is not binding anymore? So now that because God is so forgiving, even if I obey the law or I don't obey the law, it doesn't make any difference. So I can go do whatever I want to do and come back because I know God anyway will always do what? Forgive me. That is the popular teaching today. Even in men of the pulpits. But the Lord has given this church a very special message that will prepare you and prepare others for the soon return of the Lord. There is a judgment that is going on. And this judgment is based on the Ten Commandments, law of God. And the law is still binding. You break the law, you are condemned to die. Yes, God is gracious. But because He's gracious, He doesn't give you permission and warrant to break the law deliberately and consistently. That is an abuse to the God's nature of grace, of forgiveness. Romans chapter 3 verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, do we make the law void through faith? Certainly not. Don't think we do away with the law by faith through grace. We establish the law. We keep it. Those of us who have received God's forgiveness, we don't want to repeat the mistakes we did. We feel so sorry. We are more sensitive to the law. And we ask God's grace to help us so that you can live in harmony with the law. Jesus said, when he was preaching on the summit of the mountain, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. That's what he said. <clears throat> when Christ came, he lived the law. And by his example, he has shown us who have decided to be his followers. That when you, you follow Jesus, you do not neglect the law, but you live the law. You live the law because there is power to help you live the law of God. But Jesus himself obeyed the law. In Romans 6, 14, the Bible Father says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What does that mean? And many Christians have a problem with this particular verse. They say, you know, we Christians in the New Testament, in the New Testament are not under the law. Those of the Old Testament were under the law. But for us, we are under grace. After Jesus died, we have received God's forgiveness. God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. He has forgiven the sins we did before, the sins we are doing now, the sins we will do before we die. So we are living under the air of grace. We are forgiven. It doesn't matter what you do in your body. God has already forgiven you. That's the popular teaching today. And so people are bold in committing sin. People are bold in committing sin. But the message the Lord has given us reminds us that the law is still intact. And to be judged according to the law of God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. I don't want to, I don't want to steal. And you are very careful you don't want to steal. And you want to make sure that you live a life where you don't steal in your life. But will you be successful? Even when you are so careful, you realize one day you have actually broken the law. And you may not break the law of stealing, of stealing 
you may find you are broken the law of covetousness. The Bible says that if you are careful on nine and you break one, you are broken all of them. So that's the problem we face. Can I really live and obey the whole law? There's only one who lived on earth and obeyed the entire law, and that was Jesus Christ. So if you want to obey the law so that you can be saved and go to live with God in heaven, you are out for an impossible task. That is not possible. What does it mean to be under grace? When you are under grace, I come to the cross, I kneel at the foot of the cross. To be under grace means I accept Christ's pardon. Receive Christ's forgiveness, and I'm filled with His power to live a righteous life. Now Christ, when you come, you are under grace. It's only describing what happens when you realize you have done sin. And the Bible recommends once you have committed sin and you have broken the law, you can be forgiven. God has made a provision. Christ has died for you. So you come to Him and say, I'm very sorry for what I've done. I'm extremely sorry. And once you have said to God, you're sorry, please forgive me and fill me with power to enable me not to commit the same sin. Then the Bible describes and says, God writes his law in your heart and in your mind. And he puts in you a desire to obey him every time. Now, when we come to Jesus and throw ourselves at his feet, he says, my child, no matter what you have done in the past, no matter how sinful your life has been in the past, my child, I'll forgive you. You can begin again. You can begin again. That is grace. That is grace. So the law reveals our need. When I look at the law of God, I see who I am. I don't measure up to the law. When I come to Jesus Christ, when I look at this law, I see times when I have been impatient. When I come to Jesus, I fall at his feet and cry to him and I say, I'm sorry. What does David say? The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. That perfect law drives me to Jesus. Once I've broken, and now I'm, I'm helpless before God. I'm a condemned man. I'm brought bare, naked, and open. I'm exposed. What do I do? The law has already condemned me. I can't do anything. It, the only way is it points you to somebody who can help you. Go to Jesus Christ. And I come before him. And... Uh, once I've come before Christ, at the cross, Jesus tells me I'll die for you. Oh Jesus, my heart is broken, I'll tell him. My heart is crushed because of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me. Pardon me. Lead me, dear Jesus, to keep your law. Lead me, dear Jesus, to be obedient. I cry to him. Now that is what grace is all about. Remember, somebody came to Jesus once and tried to trick him. He was a lawyer. The story is in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. And they asked him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, of all the ten commandments, which is the most serious, which is the most important that I should obey? Mm. Jesus answered him in a wonderful way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall love the Lord your God that way. That is the greatest command. Then he went further to say, this is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what was Jesus doing here? He was summarizing the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang the law. And whatever God has revealed 
in the entire Bible, it hangs on these two commandments. The entire law can be summarized in one word, love. If you have the love of God in you, and uh, you, you live, you have that character developed in you, you will have accomplished the law of God. You will have done the law. You will have lived the law, the entire law. Love to God and love to your fellow man. So Jesus summarized the first four commandments as referring to your relationship with God. Love God with all your heart. And the next six commandments, starting with the fifth commandment to the tenth commandment, as the laws that define how you should love your, your neighbor, your fellow man. How you love God, how you love your fellow man. Remember when God gave the law of Moses, the Israelites were on Mount Sinai. I was carefully reading, you read Exodus chapter 18 and on. God spoke many commandments there and gave many instructions. But when it came to the Ten Commandments, He wrote it Himself. You know, there is that way God revealed this law. He told Moses to bring the stones, and God was speaking the law in the hearing of the entire nation of Israel. He spoke on the mountain and was instructing Moses to write the law. But as he spoke the law, he wrote it with his own hand. You know, for us, we believe the Bible was inspired. God spoke to the prophets and the Holy Spirit helped them to understand God's will and they wrote it in their own words. But there's only one section of the Bible where God wrote himself the way it is. And that's the temple. And he did write it on stone. He carved it. That is an emphasis. An emphasis. Keeping God's law doesn't put you in bondage. It takes you out of bondage. The Ten Commandments are not given to restrict our freedom. They are given so we could truly be free. That's why God gave them to us. I am the Lord your God. This is what he said before he gave the Ten Commandments. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. God did not give the Israelites the law before he saved them. Oh, that's wonderful news. You know what God did? He had their cry. He sent Moses. He saved them from Egypt. After one month, they have now come up to Mount Sinai. And that is the point when now God gives them. So God asks you to obey the law after he has saved you. He doesn't ask you to obey the law before he saves you. Therefore, it's motivated by love. Now that I've shown how much I love and care for you, I want you to live a happy life. And I'm giving you these guidelines to help you live well. Enjoy your relationship with me and enjoy your relationship with one another. So the Ten Commandments, which are going to be the basis, which are actually the basis of the judgment, the investigative judgment that's going on in heaven, where your decisions, your choices are being evaluated. Your claim as a child of God is being evaluated through the actions that you have done is conducted on the basis of the Ten Commandments. This is a special message that God revealed to the world through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth, who wrote these commandments with his own finger on tablets of stone as moral principles for all time, did it then, it means it is important to us. If Father say, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let's look at these ten commandments first. Did you know the first commandment? What does it say? Let's, let's, let's see whether we can see them. Now let's, let's evaluate one of these laws. Of course we are looking at this in the third one, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So God says, don't come to me through images. Come to me directly. That's what he's saying. We are looking at that entire law. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first one. Thou shalt not make unto thee graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I think this is the fourth one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That was the first one. So we are up to the law, the fourth of the fourth commandment. When it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God is simply saying, Love God enough to respect his name. This is the third one. Think of it. Thank you for correcting me. Then you are good students. And those who are talking are the old ones who are taught during but find the classes. That is wonderful. Now you remember, you know, Pastor, there you have not quoted it right. Now love God enough to respect his name. Think of it, the name of Jesus. That name at which the angels veil their faces when they mention it. That name at which the angels sing, Holy, Holy, Holy is God Almighty. And then the fourth one says, Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath, the Lord God, thy God. Now, six days shalt thou labor. Worship the creator of heaven and earth. This is what the fourth commandment is talking about. Worship him as the one who made you. What does the commandment number five say? Honor thy father. And what does that mean? In an age when children no longer obey their parents, when a kid says to his parents, you can't tell me what to do. The fifth commandment speaks loud and clear. And this command is still binding. And let me tell you, if you are here and you are showing disrespect to your parents, definitely that law condemns you. You have committed sin. Respect your father. Respect your mother. With all their weaknesses, that is God's will. That's what will make you happy. This law has really protected me on the way to relate with my father. He wasn't uh, the best if I were to judge him for that. But I know my father has taken care of me when I was helpless. There are many things he has done to me that uh, Despite the mistakes he made, he's still my father. I still love him, I still respect him, and we are still friends. So children, God wants you to respect your daddy and your mommy. What about the sixth commandment? What does it say? Thou shalt not kill. Now imagine that law is still binding. At the time when nuclear weapons are being built to kill people. At the time of abortion on demand. And uh, let me tell you today, and if you are Adventist young people, and even parents here, uh, if you have committed adultery, that is sin, don't add it by again committing abortion. Killing. Killing a child who is innocent. It's very painful. I remember when we got our third born child, we were in India and we were students. There's a difference between our first born and second born, seven and a half years. And uh, when the, th the third born came, we had not agreed. With my wife, you know, there is a time you parents understand. I was wanting that we leave at two. She wanted three. The argument was, when is the appropriate time to get the next one? I said, let's go back to Kenya. Because it's expensive transporting people. And I was self-supporting. I was self-supporting. Let me tell you, discussions I made before we were created. Hallelujah to God. So I, we started talking and discussing this, arguing on this. We didn't know that someone already had been formed. So after some time, my wife started experiencing changes in her body. And she told me, I'm not sure I'm okay. Can we go to see a doctor? And she went and she was tested for pregnancy. And lo and behold, the news, 
Yes, you are pregnant. Two weeks pregnancy. And our baby had just been born. By the way, those things are very embarrassing sometimes. Hallelujah to somebody who I'm talking to here. Yes, if you have gone through this, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you don't know how to face the public. How do I live with this thing, honestly? Yeah, people will wonder me, don't you know for this family planning? Can't you give this child time also to live and enjoy? So the doctor said, I can see the wine in your face. Let not your heart be troubled. She was a Hindu doctor, a gynecologist. And she told us, this is a very small thing. It's just a fetus. Just a fetus. You should not worry. I know you want to give your child more time for breastfeeding and, and attention. And so what? This one you can just flush. You can just remove it. Do not harm you. Do not hurt you in any way. And you have more time to take care of your child who has been born. Hey, we looked at each other. Thank God the law of God was already in our hearts. Hallelujah. Amen. We knew that we should not kill. So we said to her, let's go and think about it. We will come and tell you. So we went home and we were discussing about that fetus. And uh, we said now, this thing is too small. Of course, uh, we can do what the doctors recommended. But what does the Bible say? The fetus is already a human being who has been formed. God has allowed that person to be born. We cannot go ahead to destroy that person. And so we decided that we will obey the law of God. Because we have been taught about the law. And you know what happened? That child, we allowed the pregnancy to continue. And the gap between that daughter and the next one was a daughter also. It's just one year and three months between them. And she was born, thank God, healthy. A healthy baby. And uh, I look at her nowadays as she was growing. Sometimes she could become messy and troublesome. <laughs> Hello? And I look at her and I say, no. <laughs> you are trying to act like you you have a right to be around, eh? <laughs> it's not just work that way. You don't know there was a time we had a veto power. But thanks be to God, he had taught us that we have no control over life. God has control over life. You know that child today is a pastor's wife. And the other two are, I, I've not yielded to the point she has yielded to get into full-time ministry. They love God, yes, but they, are, they have their own priorities. Every priority is okay, but it's a special honor to be a pastor, to be a pastor's wife. So you should not kill. We should teach our people. So there should be no abortion. Our young people here, if you went and you were tempted, and you had a moral fall, and you are pregnant, it's embarrassing. But please preserve life. Amen. Don't kill. Don't abort. To look clean out here, there is judgment going on. And you have to face the record of God. Maybe that's the only child who will be a blessing to your life. There is still a commandment that says, Thou shalt not kill. What is the next one? The seventh one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now that is it. And you know at the time when there is a lack of moral purity, God's law speaks to this generation. If you don't teach your children uh, about that, that you are not supposed, and I use these words because now they are common on the internet, you as a boy who is not married are not supposed to have sex with a girl. You as a girl who is not married are not supposed to have sex with a boy. That is committing adultery. It is sin against God and against your body and against the body of the one you are doing it with. And God will judge you that we can be comfortable with and the people that we are preparing for heaven. And it's for all of us. And it's for all of us. May the Lord help us to avoid this.
Because for sure, it is breaking the law. The eighth one, thou shalt not do what? Steal. It's wrong to shoplift. Don't go to the shop, children, and take things because nobody sees you and you hide it in your pocket. That is sin. And God will judge you for it. There is an angel watching. Don't take anybody's thing without asking for it. And what about the ninth one? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shall not lie. Don't say lies. Oh, I was very particular about this commandment when I was bringing up my children. I always told them, of course, Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God with your heart and love your neighbors yourself. But I used to emphasize to my children, you can do any mistake. Any mistake. And you come to me and I'm told so and so did lie, I mean did steal, did fight, did whatever. But never attempt to lie. Never attempt to cover up. The moment I realize you are telling me lies, I'll punish you severely. I told them, accept your mistakes. Learn to accept your mistakes. I'll forgive you. If you tell me, I'll forgive you. And for sure, when they did something wrong and they came to me, I forgave them. But they knew if they lie and I discover it, I'll be very hard. I'll be very hard. And I'll not be very kind to them. And so even today, my children have grown. They're youths. They are all in the faith. And uh, they know they are stronger than me, some of them. They may be cleverer than me. But they know never go to daddy and attempt to some. They don't know how I could discover this. Somehow they believe I have a connection with God and God somehow reveals things to me. And I get to know it. By God's grace, I had connections that could help me know God. And I can, you can look at somebody who is lying and you can see it from the eyes. Because when they are lying, they cannot face you. Directly look at your eyelids. And when they ask, are you sure you are not lying? Are you sure? Two, three times. They say, hey, what an imam is. I say, imam. So I, I had to emphasize that lying is ungodly. Lying is ungodly. Now, lying is wrong. Gossip is still wrong. Gossip is a form of lying. Dragging someone's good name through the dust is still wrong. Don't talk lies about somebody. The last commandment. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not desire to have somebody's thing for yourself. These are the moral law of God binding to all humanity and the basis of the judgment that is going on today. As your name comes before hearing, whatever your actions that you have done, you'll be judged on the basis of this commandment. So as we come to the conclusion, the psalmist said, the works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. He has commanded his covenant forever. Satan lost heaven because of disobedience. Remember that? Adam and Eve lost Eden because of disobedience. God is calling his people back to the Ten Commandments law before he comes. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. God says, once you come to him, he'll put his law in your heart, in your mind, so that you know how you should determine right from wrong. If God's law is in your mind, it means you know it. God will ensure that that happens when you come before him. And the Spirit of God will remind you that what you are doing is not right. So I'll put my law in your heart. And uh, so that you shall not sin against me. God will have a last day people whose law is written in their hearts and minds before he comes again. This is the truth that the Lord has sent me to declare to all of us. 
God wants to lead you to come to that level where you are constantly conscious of His law. And with the help and power of the Holy Spirit, you order your life in harmony with His principles. They love Him enough to obey Him. And this is the description that is given in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, describing the Seventh day Adventists who will live just before Jesus comes, the ones who will be rewarded with eternal life. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to God. Here they are, the faithful ones. Those who keep the commandments of God and they also have the faith of Jesus. Those are the characteristics of the people who will be ready to go to heaven when Jesus comes. Blessed are those who do his commandments. That they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. Jesus is welcoming us into that experience. Can you allow him to write his law in your heart? in my heart so that with the help of the Holy Spirit he will enable you to live out of love in harmony with his character because in that way and there are people who are going to be with those characteristics before he comes again and he wants you and me to be part of that team a small story is told many years ago a mother took a young son to hear a renowned preacher by the name Dwight Moody after the sermon, that is the preacher, she took in line for the, she stood in the line to go and greet the preacher. She wanted her son to shake hands with the evangelist. And the boy is here, the one with the mother. When the boy's turn came to greet the preacher, he clenched his fist. He didn't want to stretch his hand, open his palm so that he could greet the preacher. His mother was totally embarrassed at this because the boy refused. Greet the preacher, he said no. He kept quiet. She asked him, she asked him, she took the boy's hand and attempted to place it in the preacher's hand. The boy will not open his fingers. <laughs> what was in the fingers? A few beautifully colored marbles were there. He thought the preacher was going to take all his marbles. That's the reason. It's not that he didn't love the preacher, but he was considering, Will this, can I trust this preacher enough with my marbles? What are you clinging to, my friend? That's the question tonight. What are you holding on to? Is there anything more important to you than reaching out and taking Jesus' hand right now? That is the question that we have to go through. The Lord is willing to forgive you, to extend His grace to you and pardon your past. His grace will transform your life. His grace will make you a new man and a new woman. What is this that stops you? As I go through the homes, pastor takes me around and the elders. One of the experiences that I have is pleading with people. We have a baptism in the 13th. Please come. Give your life to him. Make things right with God. There is a judgment ahead. But now you can receive power. God will give you power to live in harmony with this law. Accept to be baptized. These meetings were organized for your good. Say, Pastor, are you ready for it, my sister, my brother? Sometimes others say, Pastor, now that God has even sent you to come here, Pastor has been coming to me, elders have been coming to me, and today you have also come. I'm overwhelmed. I'm willing. Let me tell you, when I see that, when I hear those words, my heart is so tight. when some people be baptized some people will be shedding tears because you know the struggle they have gone through it's not on this point but I also have observed 
that there are people who are struggling, seriously struggling. I plead, I plead the best I can as a pastor, an experienced pastor. I try to convince you it's for your good. You will feel happy. You will never regret it. But I see they tell me, Pastor, just give me some time. Give me some time. There are a few things I need to talk about. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. I know that there are struggles that are going on here, but tonight, as we remember that Jesus is coming again, my appeal to you from God, don't harden your heart. If you hear the voice of God, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Come to God. Now there is pardon, there is forgiveness. Come to the feet of the cross. Tell Jesus, I'm sorry. Give me power to live a righteous life. Prepare me for the judgment ahead. Prepare me for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Must you be a good man before you come to Jesus? Must you be a good woman? Must you obey the law before you come to Jesus? No. You have already broken it many times. All that Jesus wants is you come, acknowledge it, say I'm sorry, and you start forgiving. In your record, you committed sin, you broke the law, you are condemned to death, but you came, you repented, Sought for forgiveness, and because of Jesus Christ dying for you, you start forgiving. When your name appears before the judgment, that is the record that stands there. And because you are forgiven, your name is registered among those that will be rewarded. Is it that good news? Yeah. So as we sing this song, as we conclude today, marvelous grace, marvelous grace, grace and told, I want you to Think for yourself, is there anything that will hold you from this? I don't know what's coming in tomorrow, so I want us to stand up and sing that song. Is there anything between you and God? You don't know tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Thank God you came to church. It is Sabbath. You have been struggling for so long. Maybe I was brought here for you. Maybe you are the reason for my coming. Thank you for having come before God. Having heard this message, I'm pleading with you and I tell you, when Jesus comes, you will see my figure. You will hear the pleading of God's voice through me, as humble as I may be. Please don't reject it. Because if you do and you get lost, you have no one to play. So let's stand and sing that song. And I'm going to give you a chance if you ever got sleeping, slide in the past, you left the faith somehow for whatever reasons, I want to give you a chance to come back to God. God is forgiving. There's room for you. If you have never decided to love God with all your heart, you have never repented of your sins, please come back to God. And you'll be baptized. This is as simple as it is. You must be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. Without which you'll never see them. And we have come here to recruit people for heaven. The Lord is coming. We must be ready before we go to prepare others. So think about it as we sing this song. I want to pray for you. And I want you to come. God gives you the courage to come forward. And I pray with you. So that God will help you. Be released from this burden you have been carrying. And you'll be a free person. And live in harmony with His will as we anticipate His coming. Hallelujah.